Hello, my name is Ailsa Naismith and it's my pleasure to talk to you today at VMSG 2021. I'm going to be presenting on PowerPoint, so I'll share my screen and I will pop myself in the top corner. So hopefully I'm not obscuring any content. So this incredible, beautiful volcano that you see before you is Volcán de Fuego in Southern Guatemala. It was the subject of my PhD and it is the core part of my talk today, which is on the challenges and opportunities in converting research into practice. I'll be talking mostly about Fuego, but including a few broader observations. And I'd really like to thank the institutions that I've been working with. First of all, INSIVUME, which is the Guatemalan Monitoring Institute responsible for monitoring activity of Fuego, among other volcanoes, and also the University of Bristol. Now I'd like to say hello from Edinburgh, where I'm talking from. Virtual VMSG is a first for me, but it's really nice to be able to talk about a century of active volcanism from another one, albeit one that's a lot more ancient. So Arthur's seat, which you see at the top of the image here, is a center of ancient volcanism. While it's not particularly active at the moment, a couple of hundred million years ago, it was a center of volcanic activity. So I think it's fitting to be here. I'm going to be talking about a major challenge of volcanology, how to embed investigative results within policy and practice, specifically forecasting of volcanic activity, which some of us see as, let's say, the holy grail of volcanology. And like the holy grail, it remains elusive. So I'm going to use these three quotes to, to show that. So. First of all, this quote that scientific forecasting will become a valuable and respected endeavor. Almost two decades later, we have the idea that forecasting is a fundamental objective, but volcanoes are possibly inherently unpredictable in some ways. And finally, most recently, although volcanoes do give warning signs for various timescales before they erupt, Forecasting is a key challenge for volcanologists. So with that gauntlet thrown down, where do we start? I'm really lucky to have been invited to present some work that we did a couple of years ago on eruption frequency patterns at Volcán de Fuego. And what our team wanted to do was to provide useful knowledge on several areas at Fuego that could have practical impact. These areas included characterizing the activity of Fuego and identifying the triggers for explosive eruptions, and also to evaluate the existing database of knowledge on Fuego. So we know certain volcanoes like Stromboli and Etna have been well understood and well documented for many years. And Fuego is well on its way, I think, to becoming one of those really well-known volcanoes. What we wanted to do was to contribute in a small way to putting Fuego more firmly on the map. Nevertheless, there were some challenges to this. So at the time of writing, Fuego had a fairly basic monitoring network that includes a single shortwave seismometer. There were also challenges in the meteorological conditions. So Fuego frequently being cloud covers prevents for consistent observations. And finally, in the consistency and resolution of the data that we had, there were challenges. Nevertheless, we persisted. And the first of our results was a small addition to the existing eruptive record. So this figure here shows almost 500 years worth of activity from when records began in 1524 to the late 20th century. And what we did was make a small update to uh, that record with information on the early 21st century. And 
in terms of thinking about scientific progress, I really liked what David Powell said at last year's VMSG conference on that it is made on walking slowly with friends. A uh, result of the paper was identifying a new type of activity and I think that was a really exciting find. So what we have here is 18 years of Fuego's activity from 2000 to 2018. And on the y-axis, we have VRP standing for volcano radiative power values. These are measures, measures of thermal energy from Fuego as measured by satellite. And what I hope you can see is towards the end of the graph, we have uh, much more frequent um, high magnitude values of volcano radiative power and also the magnitude or size of those um, values are is increasing. So if I highlight this here and expand it out, we have three and a half years worth of activity where both the frequency of these large values and the actual uh, magnitude of these values is increasing. So what we can say with that is that there is a new type of activity associated with frequent and large magnitude um, um, power values that uh, are being picked up by the satellite. However, what we wanted to do was triangulate our evidence, so make it more credible by using multiple data sources. And the way we did that was by uniting all the different, um, several of the different sources that were available to us. So uh, the previous slide shows the satellite information. And we also had access to seismic values through real-time seismic amplitude measurements, or RSAM. And thirdly, we had bulletin reports from INSIVUME. These um, are illustrated by the document that I put up here. They are informative reports talking about um, changes in activity of Fuego. And the thing about each of these data sources is they all have advantages and disadvantages. Our satellite was frequent, but it had quite a broad spatial resolution. RSAM was consistent, but because, remember, it came from a single seismometer, it was vulnerable to being offline, and it frequently was during our period of study. And finally, although the bulletins were detailed, they gave us qualitative data. So it was important to look at all of these data sources together to make our whole um, results more uh, believable. So this figure here is quite uh, jazzy and possibly quite difficult to look at, but I'm going to use it to show you how triangulating can reveal some really interesting results. So the time frame that we have here is three and a half years, the same three and a half years that our satellite was looking at. And the black lines represent our, our bulletin reports from Insivume. Meanwhile, the pink triangles and the blue circles represent volcano radiative power values. Now the blue circles are um, the blue circles are power values that uh, occur more than 48 hours before or 48 hours after a bulletin report, while the pink triangles occur within 48 hours of one of those bulletins. Now, what you can see is that um, perhaps you can't see very much at all, it's quite complicated, but hopefully if I guide your eye, above this threshold of 200 megawatts, what we're seeing is a really good match between the pink triangles and the black lines. And essentially this tells us about the match between the satellite report, uh, the satellite observations of a large magnitude power value and Insubume bulletin reports that record changes in activity. So we're getting a really good match between the satellite measurements and the um, on the ground reports, two very different sources of information 
that match really nicely. On to another results of the paper. So this is jumping back to the 18 years of activity. And CRE on our y-axis represents cumulative radiative energy. And what we can see over the first 15 years of our observations is a very gentle gradient where Fuego is consistently putting out uh, radiating energy. And then if we move to our time after 2015, we can see that the gradient has actually tripled. And that's a really interesting um, way to show how, um, how energetic this new eruptive regime is. Our team learned some really valuable things during writing this paper. We were able to evaluate analog volcanoes like Jaima in Chile and Stromboli that might inform our understanding of Fuego. We we're also able to establish background patterns and threshold above which activity at Fuego was significant. We were able to demonstrate the utility of a basic monitoring network, but also show its vulnerability. A single seismometer represents a single point of failure, and this going off at various times during the period of study means that you're left without data. We are finally able to identify various hazards associated with this new activity of Fuego. And it's on this last point that I want to share a particularly um, personal reflection on uh, my experience with Fuego. So I'm going to include here this uh, line from our paper and I'll let you read it. I wrote this line in an early draft of this paper and I shared it with my co-authors on the 1st of June 2018 and then took a break. For those of you who are unfamiliar with Fuego's history, on the 3rd of June of 2018, Fuego had a VEI3 eruption that produced voluminous paraclastic flows, which descended its flanks and destroyed the community of San Miguel Los Lopes, causing hundreds of deaths. And this example of the this experience for me demonstrates one of the central tensions for many of us volcanologists that we have so much information and knowledge at our disposal we are doing really interesting science and we are making continual progress towards understanding the systems that we study in greater and greater detail and yet there are some moments that um, catch us uh, unawares, uh, that surprise us and show us that these volcanoes that we study are inherently unpredictable. This was a case that uh, brought home to me uh, just how, with all our knowledge, we are not uh, omniscient and we must we have so much more to strive towards in our attempts to understand volcanic systems so moving forward from that i want to take a few reflections on some really interesting practical ways that we can continue to make progress and the first way i'm going to do that is by highlighting a paper that was recently published that does just that it puts together uh, best practices from volcano observatories worldwide that allow them to that that would allow them to continue to uh, move further along the path towards greater understanding of these systems and better forecasting. So these are the six points that um, that paper highlights, and the next one that I'm going to go on to the next paper. I think is excellent because it demonstrates at least four of these very objectives. And that paper is this. Uh, it uses 
uh, infrasound to uh, in, in recent years of Fuego to understand different processes that happen around the volcano. So for me, this is a clear example of um, using a lot of instrumentation to give us a large amount of new information. It's a open access paper that is easy, clearly reproducible and easy to understand to allow for translation to other volcanoes. But I think the clearest way it demonstrates a really good practice um, of volcanology is a clear collaboration between an observatory and universities, in this case, several UK universities and Izuvume itself. Another paper that I think is really good and shows our continual progress towards forecasting is this one here. And in summary, I think it's a really, really good paper because it uses a really interesting, relatively novel method with a clear practical application. So if I show some of my uh, favorite figures from this paper, what we see in the upper part is how optical imagery across several years of Fuego has been used to map paraclastic flows and in particular different um, facies within those flows. Below that, we have a digital, elevation, digital elevation models from across several years at Fuego. And the difference between these models tell us about elevation changes across different uh, distances down one of Fuego's ravines. And the combination of the optical imagery with the facies it tells us about with the different elevation changes from the digital elevation models gives us really sophisticated insights into processes occurring in pyroclastic flows, in this case at Fuego. So what we can see, I think in, in summary, is that pyroclastic flows, as we understand them, are fast and incredibly dangerous and very hot. So they're very, very difficult to understand the processes that are going on within them at the point of their descent. But using a combination of optical imagery and digital elevation models allows us to make really sophisticated understandings into processes occurring within a huge flow, but local processes. So within a huge body of um, material moving down slope, there are many different mechanisms occurring. And I, I just think, I think it's fascinating. I um, am really hopeful that this is applied to many more examples worldwide. The final paper that I'm going to talk about is this one here that gives us an objective method for identifying sets of analog volcanoes. And I think this is really great because I have mentioned before in this talk analog volcanoes and they are a common feature, I think, of academic volcanology where we take one less well understood, less well instrumented volcano and search for analogies in better understood volcanoes that we can may make interesting comparisons with uh, our less well understood one. But how do we quantify that? How do we understand how good of an analogy it is between volcano A and volcano B? And that essentially is what this paper quantifies. So this figure here shows us three different quantification schemes, sorry, three different schemes for goodness of analogy between Fuego at the top and the volcanoes that you see at the bottom. And the different colors are different categories of analogy. So AST is analogy of eruptive style whereas AG is analogy of rock geochemistry. And the vertical axis gives us goodness of analogy between zero and one. So we can three, see in these three separate schemes that Villarica and Yaima in Chile are consistently the best analogies for Fuego among the chosen ones. And what we have in this second graph, again, three of the same schemes, but along the um, vertical axis, we have 
percentage um, percentage of volcanoes in the global volcanism program that are a better analogy than the ones chosen. And we can see that Villarica and Yaima have really low scores so that they are indeed good analogies because almost uh, only a few percent of volcanoes within the global volcanism program actually are better analogies than these ones. And I think that's a, a fascinating, a really groundbreaking new way of actually quantifying something that as volcanologists we uh, talk about all the time. We throw around the term um, analog volcano perhaps uh, without having previously had a way of um, making it objective. So I think this is a really um, groundbreaking new work that hopefully will be applied more broadly. So having talked in the previous slides about all the progress, I would also like to briefly talk about the ongoing challenges. And I will speak of my experience at Fuego, but I imagine that many volcanologists will find this in common with their own experience of the place that they work in. So the first challenge that is ongoing is open access. At Fuego, I would say that's um, access to both articles and data. For instance, the um, people in country who have, for who uh, articles are highly pertinent, they may even be co-authors, actually have trouble accessing articles and the data they contain. In terms of roles and responsibilities, I think there's an ongoing challenge in identifying which institution is responsible for what. In Fuego's case, in Sibume and their partner in disaster risk reduction, Conred. Finally, in terms of communicating hazard and risk, the methods and pathways are incredibly important and continue to be challenging. In specifically at Fuego, a lot of information regarding its activity is communicated via social media, but who has access to this information? It's not necessarily the people who are most vulnerable to the activity of Fuego and its hazards. Nevertheless, there has been a huge amount of progress. In the two years since uh, we published our paper, there has been an incredible amount of new information and progress in particularly in improved monitoring techniques and in more comprehensive data sets. And I just like to reflect that to uh, some very prescient words uh, from a little while ago that I'll put up here. I think they speak for themselves. So before I finish, I would like to say a huge thanks to my co-authors, to Matt Watson, Rudiger escobar Wolf, Diego Coppola, Gustavo Chigna, Helen Thomas, and Carla Chin. I would like to say thank you to my colleagues in Guatemala, particularly in Insubume and Conred, and at the University of Bristol, and to the VMSG community, excuse me, committee, for giving me the opportunity to talk. And finally, I would like to say thank you to you. Thank you for listening to me and for paying attention. And I would like to invite you to the Q&A. I really look forward to having a discussion with you and to hearing your thoughts and your questions. So thank you so much. I'll finish there. Bye.